Well, welcome everyone. Uh, you're here for the Art and Science of Continuous Identity Verification. My name is Michael Brown. I'm the VP of Product Strategy for CSI. So CSI, we're the ones on the, uh, the lanyard. And no, it's not that CSI, so if you're wondering. <laughs> um, so I'm here with a, a, a great group of panelists here to talk about this, this subject. And um, you know, there's, I mean, we could spend hours and hours and hours. We already had in the green room talking about things. But we're going to try to keep it focused on a few uh, specific topics. But first things first, I want to let everyone introduce themselves. So we're going to start here and go down the line. Let's go. So my name is Philip Poland. I am the Director of Customs and Regulatory Affairs um, for DHL Express. Um, and I wear kind of a dual hat because I also sit on our trade law practice group uh, where we issue the legal direction and guidance for all of the Deutsche Post DHL family of companies related to denied party screening, sanctions, et cetera. So, and then I manage our global compliance in those areas. Hi, I'm Melissa Strait. I am the U.S. Compliance Officer for Stripe. We are a payments company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and compliance for us means anti-money laundering, uh, sanctions, uh, and KYC. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve. I'm the founder at a company called Trulio. We do global identity verification, uh, mostly for the KYC space and payment processors in, in that space, um, all instantaneous around the world in over 60 countries. I'm Doug Jacobson. I'm a partner with Jacobson Burton Kelly here in Washington, D.C. I'm a, a, a compliance attorney uh, dealing with agencies that you often deal with and don't want to deal with, such as OFAC. Um, so my role is to keep companies out of trouble, and when they get into trouble, I represent them before these agencies. All right. Thank you, everyone. That's great. Um, so we're going to call this down to a couple of, of topics. Um, so one is the uh, beginning and ending of identity verification, right? If there is an alpha and an omega to that concept, um, you know, we're gonna discuss that a bit. And then once you figure out how and whether or not you're going to do identity verification, what are the ramifications, both operationally, legally, and from a compliance perspective of dealing with the aftermath of that, specifically, uh, specifically when you're talking about things uh, like DHL where uh, it's huge scale and you know, huge operational impact. Um, so I think, we're going to start off with Steve on this one to talk a bit about the consortium concept and some of the mechanics on how you might do identity verification, and then we'll delve into the aftermath a bit after that. Right. Well, I think um, what's really interesting about this panel today is, um, you know, there are kind of two verticals in identity verification and KYC. There are the regional players and stories uh, kind of that we're all used to, and then there's kind of the new breed, which out of the gate, like Stripe, are you know international, um, cross-border, multi-jurisdictional stories. And uh, I think a, a good, I think we all know category A. So category B is um, the kind of focus, at least of our discussions today, and how to effectively run KYC programs, uh, AML programs in many jurisdictions simultaneously while you're trying to grow your business at rapid speeds. Uh, and so for us, um, those mechanics come down to, uh, as Mike was kind of alluding to, a concept of making a, a whole bunch of tools available. So you can't really, you know, unlike original story, you can't really have a single process, the process. It, you're dealing with multiple regulators, um, multiple capabilities in different markets. And so you've got to actually find a way to create this consortium of services, which then, you know, do their best uh, to check as many boxes as possible for your clients. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, that starts with the hardest part first. And so for us, it was how do you cover seven billion people with a KYC process? <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't gray before. Um, we started truly not amazing. ambitious over there, are you? I still got the hair. Yeah. So, um, but you know, the, the, the reality is, is that for all these services, you need to cover 7 billion people uh, to, to not do that or to not plan at least or try to achieve that means that you're not building the right solutions for today's needs. And so in the category B, that means that out of the gate it has to be very inclusive. So the mechanics of identity verification are inclusiveness. Um, B, speed. So the competitive uh, nature of payments in particular, but I would say all fintech, is you've got to onboard quick, real quick. Uh, you've also got to run compliance programs that don't hold up the user experience. So you've got to uh, focus on data minimization, but get enough data to do the checks. 
And then the last piece is, um, you know, for us is uh, uh, being as neutral as possible and always allowing room for the next thing. Today, um, over coffee, we were talking about sanction screening and how there's incumbents and the way that this was done before and now with all these new uh, needs, cross-border, uh, multi-jurisdictional, there's a whole new set of technologies from AI to OCR technologies all coming up that uh, alter the ranks for washless screening. And for us, again, that means a consortium model. You have to take the incumbents and all the new guys and corral them all and offer them on a platform for your clients. And then only, um, you know, not out of the gate, you're not gonna have everything in those mechanics, but you have as much as there is today, and more importantly, room and a model to make what's happening tomorrow possible for your clients. And I think that's kind of a, how, how I at least view the, the plan for us and um, I think many in our space is what can we achieve today and where do we want to be in next year and five years out? Yeah, great. So, Melissa, we talked a bit about the multi-jurisdictional nature and global nature of Stripe's business. So, if you want to focus a bit on how you guys approach that from the compliance and operational perspective. That I could probably talk for this entire panel about, but um, I mean, I think uh, to Steve's point, I mean, it, we really do have to look on a country by country basis as to a what the rules are simply from a box check perspective. You know, do we need name, DOB, address, etc. Then looking at, at sanctions, but then the kind of larger meta picture is what will um, allow us to effectively mitigate our compliance risk on a market by market basis. And so at Stripe, we're kind of big data, you know, fintech company, so we take a really data driven approach to that. Um, so looking kind of quantitatively across our portfolio, where do we see where do we see the risk? Can we score it? Can we measure it? And then what are the compensating controls that we can put across it? And those things may differ. Um, country by country, it may differ even within countries or within um, specific regions. So uh, I would say to your question of alpha and omega, there is no omega. It is it is <laughs> continuous, never-ending uh, battle of identity and verification, um, and, and and whatever that means, whether it's simply kind of your CIP, your customer identification, or whether it's kind of the larger you know the topics we're talking about here at this at this event, like what is identity and how do you define it and how do you measure it across your portfolio. And Phil, I, I guess uh, the same sort of question to you if you think about the global nature of, of your business and volume and scale. Yeah, I mean, so with the beginning and end, I mean, the reality is there isn't, it, as long as there's business with the customer, you have to be doing it. So, for example, you know, we have screening with employees from the time they, or not even potential employees, from the time they are applying for a job to when they actually get a job, you know, all of your customers all of your vendors or actual shipments, but then you have to continually rescreen them, right? So even though we set a database and we say, yep, okay, these are good customers, well, they may be good customers today, but that doesn't mean they're a good customer a week from now or a month from now or whatever. So there's always the initial screening at setup, but then we have this constant rescreening where you're always rerunning your mass database, which for us is unfortunately it's huge because just, you know, millions and millions of customers, but you know, so you're just, that, it's that kind of like, that kind of rescreening. So as long as they're doing, dealing with us, we have to always be rescreening them, as well as then we rescreened every single shipment as if we didn't have anything, because the biggest problem for us is it's not our customers, it's who they're doing business with. And most of our hits are, you know, so if I pick up, you know, 4,000 shipments a day from iHerb, which is an online e-commerce website that sells vitamins, right? So I'm not really worried about iHerb as much. I'll rescreen them on a monthly basis. But who are the 4,000 people that they're sending to? And, you know, so that's really where the big, the big risk comes. And then for us, it is big scale because we're literally doing more than a million transactions a day. And so like we were talking about in the room, just high hits alone, um, on average, we're dealing anywhere from between 12,000 and 15,000 high hits a day that then require some form of a manual double check to validate the identity. So it's one thing to run it through the screening tool, right, and get the hit. It's another thing to then have the roughly 75, 80 people that are actually going back on all of those and saying, okay, well, what's your passport? What's your date of birth? What's all your information? And let's collect all that and let's put that in a database and store that. And then how do I make sure that if I get a shipment from you tomorrow, you're not being rescreened because I already have your passport and your data and et cetera, right? So that's, that's really where the big hit in, which leads to the second question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Doug, if you wouldn't mind, talk a bit about uh, from the legal perspective that transitive nature of risk where you're dealing with counterparties and potentially counterparty counterparties and how that plays? Well, so 
that, that's a very good question, and the, the issue there is there's really no right answer if you talk to the, to the agencies, because all they do is expect you to get it right, and that's really the problem. The penalties, as we all know, have increased. For example, even now, um, under the Civil Penalties Inflation Act, the maximum civil penalties, for example, for most of the IEPA-based OFAC programs, which used to be $250,000, now that's increasing um, under the Civil Penalties Act, now to $289,000 per transaction. And particularly in the payment space, it's not, there's not gonna just be one. It's usually going to be multiple. So there's several cases um, where the big bank cases, of course, and then also a more recent case involving the payment industry, involving PayPal, is a very good example of, of not just having the tools, but how to use the tools that you have. And this is a real problem in terms of automation is great, but it's not just checking the lists. What do you do with it if you do have a match? How do you try to mitigate your the number of lists to try to minimize the hits that you're getting to minimize the false positives. And so while automation is, we'll talk a little bit about this again, automation is great, but that's only one part of the story. And so it's trying, every company has to try to figure out its risk profile. Yeah, and, and real quick on with the risks too, I mean, it, it is serious. So just give you guys one example. So in 2008, we had, um, a transaction where uh, the person was added, this entity was added to the list like on a Friday afternoon and the transaction came through on a Saturday. We updated our tools on Monday and the government came in and said, okay, but there's still a transaction there, right? And so I think we made like $70 profit or something on that, but we paid the mitigated value after negotiations was $37,000 for one, for that one transaction, right? And so it's it's fairly, yeah, it's big, right? Yeah, I think that's, uh, we'll Plus delve legal into fees. <laughs> and that doesn't count the legal fees. Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we'll, we're gonna delve into the operational impact like of, of that uh, e even more in a moment. Um, I think one of the uh, topics that we talked about uh, earlier in, in our pre-meeting was around the regula inconsistent regulatory regimes globally. Um, and we called out politically exposed persons as one of those examples. So, I don't know, Melissa, if you want to talk a bit about, uh, about that subject, which I know is near and dear to your heart. I, I, my whole team at Stripe knows that I hate, I hate PEPs, and this, I, they don't mention it to me because I get really, like, <laughs> I get really into talking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I think that kind of in this context, what we were, were talking about is that a lot of vendors and kind of the, I think the, the thinking around this is that more information is better. The more people you can find and identify as PEPs, that's better. The more lists you can screen against, that's better. The more information you can collect on your customer, that's better. And I think I would, I would challenge that. Um, I think PEP is actually a really good example of that, where we are required, um, Stripe in Europe is required to screen against a PEP list. And of course, the government does not provide to you um, either A, a list of the people that they consider to be PEPs. They ask you to define it on your own, and they give you some kind of high-level guidance around what that is. Um, and then B, the, the list that we do purchase um, don't always have complete identifying information on those PEPs. So when we have a potential match, so Melissa Strait, who is on a PEP list, then you're this identity problem trying to figure out is that, is that the right person? And then not only once you've established the identity, then you also have to figure out, well, what's next? What do I do with this person? Do I continue the business relationship? Do I exit it? Do I monitor them now every you know, week or t two days or, you know, what's appropriate because that's what the regulator expects you to do, not only to make the identification, but to demonstrate that you've applied appropriate um, risk-based decisioning to that action. Um, and so this is why I, the more, more isn't always better in these particular cases, and you need to make really smart decisions about the list that you're screening, why you're screening them, how you're making the identification, and then documenting how you treat those customers once you've made those identifications. So, Phil, do you have any other, um, I know you talked about onboarding a bit specifically around that. Was well, it an interesting conversation, if you wouldn't mind expanding? Yeah, so when it, so Pep is a politically exposed individual and I always, or person, and I always kind of view it as the friends and family plan. Um, so it's not the actual bad guy, but it's someone who might be close to him. So, I mean, this is one where I, you know, I refuse to screen against it because in my mind, I look at it as a risk. We're already 
the mass we have to do is unbelievable. And so for me to go in and then say, okay, I don't just have the bad guy, but I have, you know, the friend and family plan. It's just too much. And so we, we actually refuse to do it. And so um, we're more focused on trying to drive down, are we actually doing business with a prohibited party, with the, the actual bad guy, with that entity that you're not allowed to do business with? And so, and that's where we, and unfortunately, that's why we have to do it multiple times through, because again, it's, you can't just do it in onboarding. You have to do it at every transaction and you have to, especially with your customers, you have to rescreen. I think there's this thought that, well, I went ahead and I validated the identity of my my customer, so it's not a big deal. Okay, but what happens when three months from now they get named on a list? And so that's where that really comes in, right? So, yeah. Um, and Steve, you talked a bit about um, you know the the aggregation consortium approach, but could you expand a bit on the regulatory and data quality differences you're seeing from the data sources you're gathering, and then we can kind of counterpoint that with the impact of that from the regulatory side on dealing with matches that come from that, that system. That's actually a really great uh, addition to those comments. I think um, we were, I was you know, discussing with friends earlier today that the paradigm um, of, again, going back to the regional use case versus the international is the challenge now is, is that many regulators are participating in these new um, payment models and um, kind of taking a look at them and thinking how it fits and then trying to revise legislation. Canada just tried and messed it up and <laughs> is trying again. And um, I think that's a very common approach now to uh, you know, the, the voters. I, I, it's not the citizens, remember, the government. It's the voters want to participate in these things. And so they've got to adapt our laws wherever we live uh, so that they can. And so we're seeing that now in many countries, whether it's you know first world countries like Canada or, or Australia or even emerging markets. Um, and then the second piece is, is around, okay, so if I'm the Canadian government, because I'm Canadian, I can totally throw them under the bus on this one. We go ahead and we change the laws and we say, oh yeah, you know, we really want to make sure that Stripe can operate here and that we can onboard and every Canadian should be able to have a Stripe account and, and we can onboard quickly just like everybody else. So let's change the rules and allow data to be used. And here's the kind of data you can use. Um, now, by the way, not only can you use the traditional credit bureaus, but you can use government sources. Step one. Step two, you should be releasing government data. Now, I talked earlier today on another panel about most governments are doing this and trying to think, okay, well, how can we be open to providing data? Canada, not one of those countries. And the government put these rules out and then didn't provide any more data, so I'm not sure what the point of that, all, all that was, but I think at least from a trend line perspective, when we look at data quality, for doing things like EKYC or um, ongoing monitoring. I mean, don't even get me started in Europe on that. How do you monitor KYC data sets in, in a commercial environment? It's very expensive and very difficult. Um, and most of those sources do not have a monitoring capability. And yet, here we have legislation that you have to monitor. So it's a very uh, interesting paradigm right now. And so there's room for new technologies that help um, automate as much of that as possible. And I think uh, the technology can do one thing, but of course, all that technology is powered by data. And a lot of the data that already exists for things like banking, credit scoring, is not necessarily always fit for purpose for KYC. And that goes back to the watch list screening and the, you know, a lot of our, our customers uh, don't collect enough identifying information to make watch list screening at scale across many borders possible. Um, and so how do you meet all those requirements? And I think there's a trend now uh, with many of our customers looking at how they can utilize additional kinds of data to meet those requirements. And then second, then applying a bunch of tools on top of the data to make it more efficient. Things like screening, re-KYCing, KYCCing. Um, a lot of those rap, uh, for those of you that participate in the rap video, the CIP, the KYC, <laughs> the KYCC. There's a lot of those acronyms now out in the marketplace, but they actually all track back to some regulated uh, requirement. Uh, and those are real. Right, and so compliance officers are, you know, one hand going, okay, you know, we want to do this, we want our business to grow, but then the other hand, I've got to have the data to to make that possible, and the rules have to change somewhat. And I think we're seeing that, but but it's probably not as fast as we need it to be. 
Yeah. And I think I think you see that struggle within the within governments themselves in today's world with such a huge focus on prevention of financial crime, terrorism financing, money laundering. See the rules getting kind of more and more stringent around customer identification, knowing who you're doing business with, the requirements um, on banks and other financial institutions. And on the other side of the coin, you have customers who they don't want to give you all that stuff. They just want to get on board and use your product as fast as possible, and they don't really understand why you need you know, their name, date of birth, address, social security number, so they can send five bucks to their friend for pizza. So that's, this is kind of the, the world in which we live. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we want less information collected, but we need, to, we need more information to perform the, the transaction. It, it, they don't always uh, you know, align well, especially outside the US. The U.S. is definitely, out of all the 60-plus countries we cover, an anomaly. The ability to take an email address here and decorate it with all this other PII is unique in the world. I don't know how much longer it will stay. Uh, but um, So, again, a lot of our customers based here then go abroad and say, oh, uh, I should be able to open a bank account with an email address. The, the you know, reality of that situation is, is that that type of capability, again, the data capabilities matching the need is anomalous here. And so internationally, regulators don't always think of that when they say, oh, let's, we were saying earlier, it's good enough for the US, let's do it too, which is kind of a very common thing. But when you then you try and deploy that in international markets, it, they just don't align. And it makes jobs like Melissa's very difficult. Well, and the international governments don't provide the data. So a great example is if I get a, if I get a list name of someone, I'm going to get their date of birth, their place of birth, their passport number, you know, where their last residence is in the United States. Canada, on the other example, gives me a name and no other information, right? So I go and look at the Special Economic Measures Act and I pull the act and I go and pull down and there's in Schedule uh, 1 a list of people and it's simply a name. Okay, well, how many, you know, John Smiths <laughs> live where? I mean, you know what I'm saying? They don't even give me a country, right? Or you go to different places or Europe will give you like, a name and a country. So David Wong in Hong Kong. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. You know what I mean? So it's like that, that's one of the other big problems. And I think um, the other aspect of this, and Doug, you can certainly speak on this, is all right, data quality um, can be you know, an operational pain, but what if the data quality is related to someone being on an SDN list who maybe shouldn't be there or you're trying to get off of that list? When, so I think you can talk to that a bit. Well, the, the, gover the governments, when they are adding people to the list, I mean, OFAC does a pretty good job of trying to provide as much information as possible. So today, just a few minutes ago, OFAC added several new parties to the list, and we were just looking, and it had the dates of birth, which is, which is a very helpful um, field. But when it comes to the adding people to the list, getting them off of the list, uh, one good example is where OFAC just added 256 Syrian nationals about two weeks ago uh, under those most recent sanctions. And, and many of those names, though, are very common names in Arabic. So that's a real serious problem in terms of, of false positives that companies have to deal with. Um, you see the same thing in Latin America with, with common names. The, with respect to getting parties removed from the list, it's very easy to some extent for the governments uh, or government agencies to add parties to the list. There isn't necessarily a standard that each of the agencies has to work from. Now, they're not simply adding list, adding parties arbitrarily, but when I'm there as counsel, if somebody comes to me and says, I, I'm on the BIS entity list, I'm on the OFAC SDN list, then I have to, my role is to figure out, well, what was it that they did or may have done to get them on the list? try to get the administrative record from the agencies, which is not always easy to do, because under the Freedom of Information Act, information that is national security or, or otherwise classified is not releasable. And so it ends up being a little bit of a guessing game. And then it's up to the party who is on the list to try to meet, to, to guess as to why they were on the list, do your mea culpa to the agencies in order to start the dialogue of trying to remove from move them from the list. This has been a serious problem. OFAC has gotten better than they were in the past, but none of the agencies are transparent in that regard. So it can easily take one year or more for a person to be removed from the list. And in the meantime, it's having a negative impact on their business, a negative impact on their reputation, and a negative impact on all the other names that are similar to theirs. 
Yeah, if you think about the concept of identity in that respect, right? Your your whole reputation is colored by this. You, there's no way you can get out from under that uh, that stain on your without you know being removed, and, and it's just a uh, you know it's a manifestation of identity uh, just being added to to one of these lists that you may not have control over. Um, I want to revisit a bit, uh, and Melissa, maybe you can talk more about this, the technology side of dealing with some of these things. I know you guys have some machine learning and other um, things you're, you're looking uh, and using at, at Stripe. So if, if, we're, if Abel uh, gives a little bit of insight into that, yeah. Yeah, I can give a high-level overview, and I see some other fintech folks uh, here in the room. So, um, But yeah, so in, in addition to the traditional identity verification schemes, uh, and, and Stripe in many markets is regulated, and some it is not, but in either case, we have uh, anti-money laundering obligations from our financial partners. So we do those things. Um, we run them through OFAC, we check for PUPs, et cetera. But I think the more interesting aspects is the kind of metadata that we're able to collect on our customers um, to make some really interesting decisions about their level of risk. Um, and I think as you'll see with a lot of fintech companies, this technology generally kind of starts on the fraud side because that's really protecting the bottom line. And then over time, as the compliance team becomes more robust, compliance can start to leverage these same types of, of indicators to build uh, customer risk profiles. So um, examples of the things that we use, uh, IP address data, the device that you're logging in from, um, the locations of the, the IP addresses where the charges are coming from. So we're a payments company, so we open merchant accounts, and those merchants take card payments. Um, uh, gosh, what else? We can we look at things like, you, you know, scraping your your device, the, looking at the fingerprint, how big the screen is on your device, which has a really weird correlative effect to fraud for some reason that we're not really sure about. Um, so those are the types of things that we're able to use to really drive insights into identity. And I think those are also the types of things that are quite expensive uh, for, for criminals, fraudsters, uh, money launderers, you name it, to, to game. Um, it's one thing to you know, go buy a stolen social security number or 100 off the dark web. It's a different thing to go get 100 different phones. Uh, or a hundred different IP addresses, for example. So um, those are some of the, the techniques we use to kind of create customer uh, identity profiles. And it's, it's constant. Um, it starts essentially the second you sign up and it, it runs continuously every transaction or, or you know, within several minutes if you're not making any transactions. Yeah. And um, Phil, you talked a bit about this on uh, back to the data quality and the subject where um, you know, certainly the list data quality, the, um, you know, the machine learning and other things to maybe deal with matches, but can you talk a bit about the impact of not only data quality from the input side, but being able to, to deal with that operationally? Yeah, I mean, we, we get a lot of bad data, and so it makes the job very difficult because we're trying to screen, especially, actually, even on the customer side, I look at some of the data, I'm like, how do we even deliver these shipments? because, or how do we even pay, charge the people because we just get bad data, period. Customers just don't give us good data. And so it makes it very difficult because what happens then is you can't do effective screening. So we have to stop all of those and then go back to them and say, you know, hey, we need to have better quality data so we can even do the screening so we can move the, the, the shipment. And it's, it's hundreds a day, you know, which isn't huge when you think about over millions of day, right? But still, it's a, it's a big impact because that's a lot of negative customer experience um, to where it's like, okay, we meant stop. We got to stop the shipment, go back because you only gave us a first name or you said, you know, Mr. Smith. Well, okay, there's a lot of Mr. Smith. So what's, you know, so it's, it's, it really does, what it does, it slows everything down. Um, and then once you get that data, you have to rescreen it because the first screening you already know was bad, mm -hmm. you know? So you, then it, now you have an IT cost as well as human costs because you're, re you're redoing all that work. Yep. And uh, you had an anecdote uh, when we were talking earlier about Malaysia and some of the, the inconsistencies or, or ramifications of, uh, of matches across countries. So if you wouldn't mind talking about that a bit. Yeah, so I, I was saying what's interesting is so a lot of these countries have started to add lists. Um, I think if, in my mind, maybe to appease the U.S. government, I'm not really sure, but um, they don't know what to do with it. So then when you do get matches and you go back to them, we're like, hey, we think this is a valid, you know, bad guy. They don't really know what the world to do with it because they don't, you know, they, they put all the legislation in there, but they have no enforcement set. They have nothing, 
there, you know, even have enforcement on the books, you know. So for Malaysia, for example, if you did business with a known like terrorist or an organization that funds terrorism, it's the death penalty. But the reality is they have no way to enforce that and they don't know what to do with it. So when you go back to them, it's like, uh, we have no idea. And it's actually not just small countries, it's some fairly large countries as well. So what you really see is a few countries really have meat around this, like the US, um, despite all of the 120 some odd countries that have regulations on this. Yep. So um, the other topic we wanted to discuss a bit was more forward looking. Um, so maybe some trends around not only um, you know, the, the lists and the, and the regulatory side, but also trusted digital identities. And this has been touched on in a number of other topics. But um, you know, having some better way to uh, quantify someone's identity and in, and in context, right? Because each transaction or each interaction has a contextual flavor to the identity you want to present uh, as part of that. So I know, Steve, you had some thoughts around that maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, there's two uh, big, you know, trend lines, 2016 and now into 2017. I think uh, 2016 it was the year of the of the government, uh, you know, data set. So we saw out of all these, you know, hundreds of suppliers in our ecosystem, we see the most demand for government issued identity, and I think um, it tracks back to the real world, right? So when we you know, we trust most of those government documents. You don't present a library card when you're buying alcohol. And so as an uh, example online, we uh, expect the same. And so there was a lot of demand and we've seen since then a lot of governments, um, or at least a handful of them, but a lot, stand up these programs of, uh, you know, large scale deployments of building out trusted identities that can be used both online and offline. I think that's a great trend and one that will continue. Um, and then that's being coupled now with the year of the mobile device, as Melissa was saying. So we're seeing a lot of customers trying to do correlation uh, between the device as a, as a factor uh, to control the identity. Because, of course, there's all these breaches, right? So it's not that hard to get the PII that you need to check a regulatory box. But from a fraud perspective, and as we were saying, it starts there, there's a desire to combine inform compliance with some of that data, but also, you know, curb fraud. And so we're seeing a lot of demand for mobile carrier data um, as, a, as a trend. It's it kind of probably been around for a long time and different elements of the mobile. You know, the phone number, of course, is cool, but more importantly, network level data, as you were saying, whether it's IP address, device, um, things like not just screen size, but even, um, you know, Postpaid, prepaid flag, SIM swap, call forwarding, all those fun things that the networks know. Uh, again, common in the US, available for a long time, not so available internationally. There's a renewed uh, vigor for developing those, those data sets and tools. And I think the, the real interesting thing is when you combine the certainty of a government issued identity with the uh, dynamic control of a mobile device. You've, you've really got then the perfect marriage, much like uh, the face to the ID card. We're not going to do that, um, but I think uh, what we are going to see is more coupling of those two technologies. I think they're very powerful. And it, by the way, it happens to include a lot more people in the world that don't have those, uh, that, that trust yet. You know, as, as in example, India, we're watching scale up a huge identity project uh, for the last few years. And now, of course, the mobile carriers are getting involved in connecting those, those two pieces of, of identity. It's very, uh, uh, not only a trend, but a very exciting one. So uh, other folks have comments about that? Uh... Well, my prediction is for identity is I think that we're going to see more non-English characters in screening lists. There's been an important need for that, particularly on the U.S. list, because you have all these parties, particularly outside of the U.S., whether Arabic names, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and we're starting to see OFAC slowly populate the SDN list with some non-English characters. So we've seen some parties in Japan, that we're seeing um, some Japanese, and, and I really think that's the wave of the future because, be, 
when you translate names from any language into English, there's always going to be errors. And even algorithms and the, the smartest search function isn't necessarily going to capture that. So I think that's just my trend that I, would, that I expect to see in the, in the near term. And Phil, we talked a bit about um, the de-risking. So I don't know, that seemed to be a, a, maybe a negative trend if you want to expound on that a bit, like some of the stuff you're seeing. Oh, yeah, I mean, we were just, because we were talking about what, you know, from the two compliance sides, right, from a corporate perspective and, and viewing with risk. And it is a major, it is one of those areas where you have to constantly be looking at it and saying, okay, an answer to management, what's the risk if I don't do this? What's the risk if I do this? Because it is a huge cost and it's going to be an ever-growing cost and it is a, but it's a need. Um, but you, at the same time, you really do need to take a risk-based approach on it because when you start looking at it, um, this is a little, I mean, like we were talking about selecting of the list, for example. You know, the screening more data does not necessarily improve your risk. In fact, all it does is make you more headache and more cost. So it really is important that you look at it and say, okay, what are my true risk? How do I identify that? How do I mitigate that? What list am I selecting? And then even into the transactions and how you look at it. Because if not, you know, like Melissa was saying, you're going to just get like this massive data and then it's like, okay, what do I do with it? And more is not better. Quality is good, but more is not better. And, but that's the problem is you, there's this, this tendency to just get more and more. Let me look at more. Let me search more. And how do I do, you know, really intelligent screening with, you know, that's really fine point that it's a risk decision on a lot of it too. I think on the de-risking topic too, um, I think I do think governments are starting to worry about this because the regulatory environment has been such that a lot of different types of traditionally high risk businesses, money service businesses are a good example, were, were largely de-risked, essentially exited by their bank partners, which drove those people and those businesses essentially underground or to banks or financial institutions that really didn't have the systems in place to support them. And I do think that, and I'm, I'm actually so happy to see here um, some, some um, different companies representing kind of the underbanked, because I think that's so important in kind of establishing um, good lines of communication with the regulators, showing them that this can be done, that it can be done effectively, there are ways to manage this. Um, and flip, I think, some of the traditional thinking about what is risk on its head. Um, because I do think that governments are increasingly seeing that their strategies around um, enforcement on some of these high-risk business models has, has potentially had a, a bit of an un unintended consequence for them. Yeah, and like some real, real examples, right? So if I'm thinking about it, you know, like the politically exposed person list, right? It is not the actual bad guy. It's the people that are around them. So from a financial perspective, you have to deal with that a lot more. But for me, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to deliver a package to them, and do I really care? Um, and as well as even, so for example, there's a list for FCPA, which is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So these are companies that have gotten in trouble because they bribe someone. I can still do business with them. You know, it's just, it's out there because it's there. If you're doing financial transactions, it's something you need to be worried about. I don't care about it. I can still deliver a package to them, you know? So, you know, I don't screen any of that stuff because I don't care. Tell me what's going to prohibit me from shipping a package. What, tell me what's going to limit my ability to physically move that with them. You know, even with the SDNs, I can do informational material. So if I'm moving mail, I'm not as worried about it because the mail's exempt. So, you know what I'm saying? So that's an area where we cut back and we do a lot less risk on that because, you know, I mean, Osama bin Laden could theoretically still get mail, you know? I mean, it was that now, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, he was on the list, right? It's a great example. So you have, so you, your risk model really leads into that. Well, she has to do something completely different than I do because you're dealing with a financial transaction and your restrictions are different. So that's where you have to, so that's kind of like some very concrete examples, right? Where you have to go in and look at that. One size doesn't fit all. But, but the common denominator there, regardless of your industry, is really from the, government perspective is that they're re really looking for once you have a problem, what have you done? That's that's really important thing for this is what you have done with the issue, whether you actually have an actual match, what steps have you taken to mitigate that risk? And I would also encourage you to look into the voluntary disclosure process because financial institutions, companies, others who actually file a voluntary disclosure with the agencies have they're viewed positively, favorably, and the likely penalty is going to be very low, if 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 any. So that's a very important part of they're looking at what you've actually done from the compliance perspective, all the way down to the um, 
you know, what you've done following your compliance review and you ultimately identify an issue. Yeah, Doug, you might want to talk about the documentation with that too. So Well, and then again, you see lots of different tools. You really do have to have an audit trail, uh, have some real-time ability to demonstrate what you have done. And I see this a lot with different screening tools that I see. Some don't even have an audit trail at all. So what you have to do is you have to either PDF it or print it out or, or save it in some drive, and that's not a very efficient way. If you can have a, a system where you have a real-time auto, auto, audit trail, and then you could go back to that a couple of years later and say, okay, here we had a problem, uh, here's our list of actually what we did, I think that's a very important very important part of that. Yeah, that's one great thing about your guys' tool. So, not to brag on them real quick, but so because we use we use their tool, but so there's actually a comment box on there, so our screeners can physically document their decision. I looked at this. This is what I analyzed. This is the decision I made. You know, if it gets escalated, so you know, I'm looking at I escalated Melissa. That's that's in the audit trail, and then she can go in there and say, "Yep." Pull up, escalated me, here it is. And then when I get that person's ID back or I have their data, I can actually load that into there and it stores it. And then that's all auditable, right? And so therefore you, you have a physical documentation of not just, oh yeah, I did the screening, but what was the physical decisions or was the actual, not physical, was the actual decisions made by people? Yep. So um, guys, we only have a couple minutes left. So I didn't know if there were any questions from the audience members. Yeah. Uh, I I will kind of I, this is to be to be totally honest not my um, not my real area of expertise. We've got other folks at the company who really focus on the privacy. I do think the interesting thing about that, from from my understanding, uh, which is pretty high level, um, there's an interesting distinction they appear to be drawing with financial crime, uh, fraud. I do not think is included in that. Uh, they see fraud as like, you gotta deal with your own risk. You have to, that's kind of a company problem. They don't see it as necessarily a kind of overall financial ecosystem problem. Yeah. So there are carve outs, I believe, on AML and the, Yeah, and it, with screening, there's specific carve outs with the privacy. So we, we actually, yeah, I don't deal specifically with privacy, but I have to butt heads with the privacy lawyers all the time. Um, because every time I try to do something, the privacy lawyers step in and say, no, you can't do that because of privacy. So a great example is like screening employees and, and all kinds of stuff. I'm a US person, so if I'm over in Europe and our screeners are doing work, I can't look over their shoulder, even though I can go log into the system and get access to all the data, you know, it's it, because of privacy. But what the one area that we've never had challenges with is with the screening because they're requiring the screen. They're saying, look, you can't do business with the people that are on these lists. And so we go in and we say, okay, but we have to be able to screen against that list. Um, and then it also depends on the country. So for example, in Germany, they've got the workers' council. So one of the big fights we've had with the workers' council is, okay, well, you're not gonna let us screen employees, but yet I can't hire one of these people. And I think one of the landmark things was with Volkswagen. So, um, you know, Volkswagen, some of the people that were involved in 9-11, right, had been employed with there. And so you start going back, you start saying, okay, well, but wait a minute, you actually, they had employees, but because you weren't allowing screening, they couldn't tell, right? So then you're able to go back to the workers' council and kind of push and say, okay, well, here's a, a live case. So you need to be able to allow us to screen our employees because how else can we know we don't do business with them? But you have to fight that through the workers' council in Germany, for example. So, so you care, you care a single uh, statute law that applies to Correct. I know, yeah. So it makes it tough. So how do I screen if I can't if I can't store the data? If I go back, or you have to store it, but then I destroy it, and then it's it's tough, right? Yeah, I butt heads with the privacy lawyers all the time. Every time I try to implement something, they're like, "No privacy." <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I appreciate we're out of time, but um, we'll hang around for a moment if you have any other questions you want to come up. But thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.